This is part 3 of 3. Make sure you check out parts 1 and 2 first. They are linked in the show notes below. Get into it. Yeah, we, we were just talking about, uh, we are just finishing talking off uh, Sophia and her kind of many uh, iterations, but we were just about to start the Demiurge, um, mm-hmm. which is really uh, <laughs> the kind of, oh, it's such a headache when you're trying to speak to people who have never heard of Plato or Plato's Demiurge and you're trying to explain that this Demiurgic figure is not necessarily a malevolent being in any other system apart from this specific Gnostic system. Um, so that's kind of frustrating. So I hope to kind of dispel some of that tension so we can make everyone's life easier moving forward. Um, so of course, uh, we left the Sophia story from the Apocryphon of John where she's just created this being. She's, uh, left him in this luminous cloud. I forgot to say that she's also giving him a throne to sit on, which I guess is nice of her. Um, while she kind of sorts out her situation and has to kind of like reassess and think about what she's done. So the, uh, the entity that she creates from this uh, situation in the Apocryphon of John is the Demiurge who has given, is given the name Yaldabaoth, which again is one of those really ambiguous terms that doesn't have a, a clear meaning. There's been a case for Son of Chaos, uh, but that's kind of uh, been a bit debunked. Um, there's Blind God. Uh, There's kind of some vague association with Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. Um, But yeah, for the most part, uh, it's... I heard a great theory. I can't remember the scholar. It w- maybe it'll come to me, but it but it's it's, it's it is a scholar that you would recognize a very good one. I was, I was listening to a podcast. I, I think it might have actually been the Schwepp, and they said it might just yeah. be a nonsense word. It might just be a nonsense word, and they kind of mean it to be a nonsense word to kind of depict the, the kind of chaotic, nonsensical uh, nature of this being. So, I, yeah, I really like that theory. I, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Well, it's not the only one, right? There are several words uh, that we that we find in the Gnostic tense, uh, texts that don't kind of mean anything necessarily. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to yep, support that theory. <laughs> um, but for the most part, uh, well, I guess we've seen in, in a few different iterations now that uh, in some instances he's like this incredibly malevolent figure and uh, whenever I think about the malevolence of the Demiurge, I always think about, you know, that Hannah Barbera cartoon. Um, I think it was that racing cartoon, but, you know, Dick Dastardly. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, this, that's this, what I think. This is of. great. Everybody, everybody picture Dick Dastardly as, as the Demiurge. Because <laughs> we're always like, trying these comparisons, <laughs> but this is the best one yet. So maybe we can work that in liturgically. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, well, let's get the cartoons in there because why not? Because they're also forms of storytelling. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, I, he's, you know, he's this, like, scheming, malevolent, like, kind of comically evil dude. Um, that, uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I think of when I think of the kind of traditional malevolent uh, image of Yelzebaoth. But uh, other iterations, as we've seen so far, uh, he's not quite as malevolent or he's kind of, Let's be honest, he's a bit confused, right? He's just been born from Sophia into this realm. He's like never, he's literally a newborn. Uh, he's never experienced any of this before, uh, according to Apocryphon of John, of course. Um, he's been dumped on a throne, surrounded by a luminous cloud. He has this kind of spark of light in him from Sophia. He doesn't know what the hell's going on, right? Um, so clearly I have a little bit of empathy for, <laughs> for the for the uh, Demiurge for the Bale, but that's okay. No, exactly. Um, and, and and again, when we're talking about sort of, uh, you know, Sophia and, and the sort of message of creating outside of, of community, I, I think there is something that's very obvious to modern people, but again, was very sophisticated for the ancient world. It, this seems very strange for, for modern ears, but there wasn't always ideas that the way you raise children had an effect on them. You know, there, there was ideas in the ancient world that people were kind of just born the way that they were, that they had a face. Um, and the perhaps if you to take a kid and you hide it you're so disgusted by it you leave it alone you push it out of your community you don't tell the rest of your family uh that that it even exists and you hide it in a cloud on a luminous throne and it's left all by itself it's going to be a little messed up right this seems very obvious to modern people although maybe maybe it should be more obvious but uh you know this this is kind of groundbreaking psychological insights at the time if you ask me in many ways yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I can definitely say he would have gone through some kind of trauma, right? Uh, yeah. You know, he's he doesn't have a mother, essentially, because she's freaking out about what's just happened. And 
he's left to kind of you know his own devices but um yeah i'm pretty sure and uh, correct me if i'm wrong but in the rest of the apocryphon of john's uh sophia after she creates the other way else she kind of moves away uh she kind of thinks about what she's done she's like super repentant of her mistake and it's only after that she repents that the pleroma steps in to kind of help out right and i think that's yes. something that you were saying before about why everyone is questioning like oh well why didn't the pleroma snap the fingers that you know the i dream of genie nose wiggle and make everything disappear and i think um that's not the point of the story the, yes of course they can step in and fix everything but i don't think that's necessarily the point of the story but also there's no avenue then if sophia doesn't do this for creation creation of the yeah. universe and the creation of uh the, the mortality of human beings right so yeah yeah and also when we talk about sophia's mistake you know they, they do reiterate some of that and she's forgiven but you know maybe the, the uh, and i can't read coptic but you know perhaps her mistake is not creating by herself maybe her mistake is 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 rejecting out of bayoff right you know maybe Ooh. that was her her great error um so uh yeah you know what i'm gonna say hey joanne continue <laughs> well that's i think that's a really good point right because that raises also uh, what you're saying before about being raised in community or being a part of community so essentially he's kind of stripped of that right and uh i guess by sophia kind of leaving him alone to do his own devices while she's working her own stuff out like again she's supposed to be the embodiment of divine wisdom yet this this horrible or so-called horrible thing occurs and she kind of completely extricates herself out of that situation without kind of you know, imagine had Yaldabaoth been guided by Sophia, had he been guided by the wisdom of, you know, of the divine, what, what kind of world potentially we may have on our hands? It may have been a completely different situation, right? So there's just some of the things I like to think about in my spare time. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so for the, for the most part in most of the Sethian literature, he's kind of this, like, quasi-maniacal kind of malevolent figure in, in most instances. Um, so also uh, he's kind of given other epithets as well or other names. One of those names is Saklas, uh, another is, uh, which means fool. Uh, another is Samael, which means blind god. Um, and it's kind of uh, kind of projected onto Yaldabaoth that he's this creature of ignorance. He's this creature of blindness. Uh, he doesn't actually know what's happening. He's just, you know, kind of drunk on the power that he's been born into, but he doesn't actually know how to direct that power in some kind of uh, way that's uh, geared towards kind of divine creation. He, he just doesn't, he's being, you know, given this massive power, he doesn't know what to do with it, right? So uh, from that power, I guess, he creates uh, seven authorities, also called archons. Uh, sorry, no, he first he creates the 12. He creates the 12 archons, um, and they are kind of, if, if Yaldabaoth is kind of like chief malevolent being, the archons are certainly malevolent. Like there is no kind of text that says, actually, the archons are great. They're like really non-hostile, friendly beings. Like that's not the case at all, right? Um, and so uh, the the kind of the archons, there's 12 of them. Obviously, there's kind of um, interwoven within this text kind of astrological symbolism, um, particularly because Hellenistic astrology was something that was um, incredibly um incredibly popular and in the minds of a lot of people kind of as we were speaking before about the Hellenistic period it's kind of a foundational kind of way of thinking um like you were saying a way of people to understand their fate as well that was a really prominent um prominent tool that people had in the ancient world um but so from the the 12 archons they decide that they need their own henchmen and so they go on to create seven more which have of course been assigned to the tr traditional Hellenistic seven planets um, the seven um, heavenly spheres, the seven days of the week. We can keep going on and on with the symbolism. Um, but then, so now we have all of these archons who are kind of in a way subservient to Yaldabaoth, um, to the Demiurge. And we can immediately see how this kind of situation is is completely different to, I guess, in juxtaposition to the Platonic Demiurge, right, who takes the, the essence of uh, the realm of forms of the world soul he takes the uh, material elements and he creates this really beautiful good universe he's that his first act is then to create uh the olympian gods who then are in charge of creating humanity and that's completely not what we see here right in this text it's completely different um uh the 
there's this kind of strain of evil, this kind of strain of uh, malevolence, and it's not a good situation. It's not a good world that that the demiurge in this instance is creating. It's a world of suffering. It's a world of chaos. It's a world that um, people are not having a good time in, right? Um, so that just kind of makes me wonder in the ancient world, if this is the world that they're painting, that they're living in, that they're creating in, it kind of makes me think of, you know, what were people experiencing in this time? What were the hardships that they were having to think of, you know, living in a world that was so like horrible and full of suffering and full of evil? Yeah. And, and and again, for the Gnostics, it was as above, so below, right? We've already noticed how there's there's kind of different layers, levels. I, I keep saying this, but uh, another Bishop Tim line, but it's also quite obvious because as we've talked about, people have read these texts, they paused and read <laughs> them. But the, the creation of, of the Demiurge and the Archons is sort of a parody or a mirror of the creation of the Aeons and the unfolding yeah. of the... Of, of the Aeonic realm, right? So let's yep. so that's one layer. Another layer. What what's the next layer? Well, it's our world. Now we can do an entire mini series teasing out some of the the political metaphors that are in the Apophrakanachon. But that said, it's not just a simple political allegory, right? It is meant to work in many different ways. But to, to make it obvious, and people have heard me say this on the show before, Archon just meant ruler. It meant your local ruler. So yeah, exactly. a modern translation, a modern idea would be like member of parliament, congressperson, yeah. mayor, right? It's very obvious. And now people at the time, non-Gnostics, uh, Roman officials, I, I don't think they would have been very happy because it's not it's not subtle right when you're using that word archon like i don't think they would have been very happy about that yeah absolutely um yeah it's definitely a, a, a term that was used in a uh, political context so yeah there's there's definitely something that kind of sparks uh, like oh what was happening there you know and of course during this time there's now been like a few hundred years of roman occupation of egypt so it's it's not like you know that it's you know the first century BC and the Romans are kind of just coming in. It's like they're here, they're established. That Rome is flourishing. It's an empire. It's incredibly powerful. So the I think yeah, the Archon serves sort of a blind, dumb god. And you know who was a living god? Who was who? Who did you have to offer uh, incense offerings to, uh, yeah. sacrifice to as as a god? Well, the Roman emperor, right? And again, yes. uh, you know. I, I think people at the time would have picked this up uh, a lot more obviously than, than people now. That said, I do not, and I'll reiterate, I do not want to break this down to just a simple political one-to-one uh, -one allegory. You know, I think there's a lot more going on here, so I do want to re reiterate it without at the same time refusing the, these kind of obvious reflections. Yeah, I, I, it's like metaphor within allegory, within allegory, within metaphor. So it's kind of like this whole situation that's happening that's like incredibly difficult to tease out. Um, but moving on to what the archons actually do and their purpose. So, yes, like uh, John said, it's uh, kind of meant to be as a kind of parody to uh, like all the uh, the four luminaries and the embodiment uh, within the luminaries. It's meant to be kind of like a a reflection. Again, there's that metaphor of reflection or like a mirror of what's happening in the realm below because the text explicitly state that uh, Yaldabaoth is using the divine blueprint to create, right? He's not just kind of making this up on the fly. There's a, there's a spark of Sophia that's still inside him. So in some ways, he still has this connection to kind of the divine realms above and he's using that uh, in emulation or yeah, in emulation of that, he's using that to create, right? So there is some kind of logical unfolding of, of the material realm. It's not just like chaos and he's figuring it out. Um, but one of the things that he ends up having to do is he has to create um, human beings or the, the, material, um, the material body, which, again, he assigns to, um, in the Apocryphon of John anyway, he assigns to the Archons which then kind of divvy that up and assign it to, I think there's 365 of them in the long version of, of the demons or the entities or spirits that are responsible for, you know, manufacturing a specific part of the human body. Um, but that manufacture of the human body only comes about because of that spark within Yaldabaoth. You know, he kind of hears, I think he hears the voice of Barbello, I think it is, um, in, in the Trimorphic Protonoids explained as Barbello, 
but he hears the voice, like this divine voice, and he sees the reflection in the living waters and it kind of tricks him, right, into creating um, a, a vessel through which the kind of the rational soul or, or the divine spark can kind of um, become manifest in the material realm. And so he's tricked into giving up his light. He blows like the breath of his spirit, the divine essence that he stole from Sophia into the souls, like the, the primordial soul of Adam, of humanity. And from then, um, it can't just like chill in its spiritual form. It needs to be housed in a human body, which is then, uh, like I said, the responsibility of the minions of the archons. So we have this kind of quasi um, kind of uh, platonic yet uh, uh, Judaic take on this kind of creation of the Garden of Eden story, um, trying to make sense of some of the like the core themes that are coming through from the um, the traditional Genesis story and trying to kind of pass those out using platonic principles but also kind of trying to bring things together and in some ways it's incredibly confusing in some ways it's it's also direct um but what is clear is that that kind of spark of humanity that is present um in kind of the rational soul if we want to use platonic terms does directly come from Sophia and in turn that does come from the pleroma so that um is kind of the point of all this right that 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 part needs a body um so then I guess uh, a little bit about the archons themselves um and who they are um and I think this is really interesting and this is the kind of most overt um direct symbolism that we have of not only um kind of the Genesis story being a direct um book from the Hebrew scripture but there's also uh, particular epithets of the Jewish God, the highest God, that are used as names of the archons who are meant to be, in this story, the most malevolent entities, right? So in the um, original 12 that are created by Yaldabaoth, we have, uh, for example, Adonaios, Cain, Abel, Belias. These are all uh, names that are incredibly familiar from Genesis, um, but from um, the Hebrew tradition as well, particularly Adonai, right, which means Lord. Um, this is now a name of one of the chief, like, demons, essentially, of the lower world. Like, that's that's incredibly interesting. Um, and then from those 12, and there obviously are others which don't have as direct associations, um, but there are uh, now a further seven that are created from the 12 who have names like Iao, which is, you know, a direct name of God, right? Sabaoth. Adonin, which is similar to Adonai, right? Sabataios, like Sabaoth, for example. So we have this like direct, like digging in the claws now of like this direct commentary on the kind of malevolence of perhaps aspects of uh, what was a traditional uh, Jewish deity, right? The, the, sure. the supreme god of, of Judaism. And, and before before people start calling us anti-Semites in the comment, I, I would like to point out, as we've talked about before, you can also see aspects of the Egyptian gods, of the Greek gods, of Zeus. This, this is a parody. This is an interrogation of, of all the religious systems known to the creators at the time, right? So they're not, they obviously, they are drawing quite a bit from the Judeo-Christian tradition, from the Jewish traditions, but they they are uh, interrogating uh, all of the religions that they know about at this time, including you know what, what Plato has to think about religion, what Plato has to think about God, what the Egyptians have to think about God, what the Greeks have to think about God. You know that said, I, I don't want to let any any Gnostics or or any Christians for that matter off the hook for for anti-Semitism because or anti I should say anti-Judaic sentiment, right? Because it is there. It's there in the traditions. It's it, it can be uh, drawn out of the Gospel of John. I you know I, I think the Gospel of John is saying some sophisticated things, setting up a uh, um, uh, um, contrast between true Israelites and true Ju uh, and Judeans. But that, that that's a whole discussion. Uh, so at the same time, we want to wrestle with this. We don't want to let it get away from us. But you know the Gnostics aren't aren't particularly anti-Semitic, right, or anti-Judaic. They are looking at all the religious systems they know about, and they want you to really wrestle, interrogate, think about them, think about power structures, structures, think about the God that is above God, which at the end of the day is actually a very 
Talmudic Jewish way of, of thinking about things. You know, actually coming back to the, we're at the very beginning, we're talking about Plato as a wrestler, right? Of course, Israel is a wrestler, right? It means wrestling with God. So uh, it's, you always have to keep this, this wrestling going and be in the middle. So there's there's my little song and dance about that, my, my little PSA. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's important because, again, this is the the brush, the tar brush that Gnostics get that painted with is that this trope of anti-Semitism, and that's absolutely not the case, specifically in a Sethian context because they are a group of Hellenistic Jews um, and anti-Semitism doesn't actually exist as a concept at this time, right? Um, but what certainly does exist at this no, time, it... and we see this, sorry, go on. Oh, uh, I was just going to say I, I am quite fond of the theory that that the the Cephians, and we didn't make this explicit that, that the Cephians are are originally a a uh, come come from a Jewish group and then it's later Christianized. Um, some yeah. this this is an older theory. Some scholars disagree with that, but they're wrong uh, because we kind of have the proof in the text, right? We we have right. we have you can really see as I said, it's uh, the, the take back what I said earlier, where where this is a very carefully constructed text that um, uh, a lot of things aren't there uh, by accident, like you can kind of sometimes see in other religious texts uh but what you can see is is that somebody took it and uh waved some jesus on it right that <laughs> that there seems to be an earlier layer uh where there where there isn't as much jesus stuff so the, the, it probably did come out of a group of uh egyptian hellenistic uh, uh uh jewish people um and one of the reasons that that they're going so deeply into genesis is because they're obsessed with genesis they love genesis they want to combine genesis with plato and their insights about how religion works and how religion could be exploitative they want to get to the true god they want to get to the god that is above god they want to get to the ultimate reality and they are using the tools that they have right greek logic uh uh platonism egyptian religion and the book that they love so much genesis yeah don't forget they're also piggybacking off uh philo's four book commentary uh <laughs> platonic commentary on genesis as well right he exactly. spent a lot of time and effort as a, as a, you know, a, as a Platonist and as a, a deeply devout Jewish man, um, just going through the Book of Genesis. And you know that that tradition of biblical ex exegesis didn't stop; it hasn't stopped now. Like uh, there's still people that are writing commentaries on Genesis, and still people that are trying to uh, kind of unpack it and all the kind of wisdom and metaphor and similes that are kind of apparent in genesis it's an incredibly complex and diverse book and it's you know it's something that's across the board throughout time being interacted with in different ways and we just happen to have it now or just are discussing it now in a gnostic context right yeah, yeah, but this uh, uh, there's lots of examples of uh, in both the Jewish and Christian traditions of what you're talking about, where where sometimes it almost feels like a reversal uh, or, or a Gnostic exegesis. So a great example that I like is is uh, I know this sounds like a diversion, but it's really not. Uh, I, I think people will see the point. But you know the the, the famous um, Abraham Abraham sacrificing his son story, right? The Abraham sacrificing Isaac. So, uh, so obviously, uh, uh, God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac to him, uh, and Abraham says, "Okay, you got it, God." And then, you know, he's about to um, to uh, sacrifice his son, and at the last moment, uh, God intervenes, right? And the way it's usually interpreted is that that Abraham loved God so much that he he passed a test, right? by uh by doing by doing his will but some uh talmudic uh commentators some some jewish commentators throughout the last uh, thousands of years have said oh actually abraham failed the test he, he wasn't supposed to uh, uh try to sacrifice his son so you know what i mean like this is this is within these traditions right that you can look at these texts and you can say oh wow you know actually uh uh uh, the, the, this hero in our tradition really screwed up because these texts would be very ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, this is how I think we're to read them, perhaps. And the, the Gnostics are just taking this to 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 the next level. To uh, I'm saying level a lot to the extreme. I often <laughs> say the Gnostics love to take the extreme. Yeah, they do. Um, but I think that's also their their kind of method of uh, philosophic inquiry as well. You know, like we were saying before about academic skepticism, it's using, you know, reason 
and it's kind of uh, stepping beyond emotion to kind of get to the crux of truth, you know, trying to make inquiries, rational inquiries as to how the best way as a group we can move forward to to kind of try and tease out the deepest truths that we can by questioning things, right? So, yeah, I don't necessarily see this uh, as inherently negative in any way what, what the Sethians were doing. I think it's just... Um, it's just a commentary. Like we said, there's many different levels, uh, many different ways and metaphors and similes and stories that are, that kind of all come together in one huge jumble that we kind of have to slowly kind of tease out or, you know, try to understand um, as a cohesive whole as opposed to just only focusing in on one part. I think that does the text and the tradition a disservice. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, back, yeah. back, so to I, back to it. Back to it. Yes, back yeah. to it. Um, so um, I think, yeah, that was uh, just basically rounding off um, who the Archons are. But just to quickly mention about the seven, as I said, they were um, directly connected to the seven planetary entities and the, and the seven spheres of heaven. Um, which was uh, a deeply Hellenistic kind of worldview. Um, and, of course, I think something that we have to touch on circling back to Plato as well is what I mentioned at the end of the Plato discussion, and that was the instance of malevolent daimons, right? So um, to me, I think reading Plato into this situation with the archons, um, I definitely see the daimon is here or the kind of malevolent influence. And, however, I think the way that it differs is that I don't necessarily think that they're connected to a person's behavior i think that um in some ways they're just um kind of entities that exist and then they make it their job to kind of keep humanity or, or keep people uh, focused on the material world as opposed to kind of looking within themselves uh, igniting the divine spark and then beginning that process of reconciliation so that they are able to kind of transcend the material realm and head back up into in the Gnostic sense, the Pleroma, in the Platonic sense, um, into the realm of forms and ideas, right? So, yeah, I think that's one distinction to make. And I think it, uh, the texts drive home that that is the objective of, of Gnostics, of humanity, but I think something that also merits discussion in the Gnostic texts or in the Sethian texts in particular is that this opportunity to kind of achieve personal salvation and reunification with the pleroma is not an opportunity that is open to everybody right um unfortunately so it's not kind of a although i think it's it's kind of explicitly stated that all of humanity contain the divine spark it's only a certain few or a select group of people that are actually able to kind of awaken that spark entirely and then transcend back up into the pleroma and in this particular set of texts, as we said before, those people are the sons of Seth, the seed of Seth, um, the enlightened ones. They're a particular group that have this kind of special advantage because they believe they are the spiritual inheritors of the seed of Seth. Um, they are kind of directly descended from the, the heavenly luminary Seth, so they have some kind of special advantage. And these are the group of people that um, Barbello and the Logos and Seth kind of incarnate and help to awaken. Like it's only these particular group of people, um, which I think is really interesting that this is only available to a certain sect or a certain um, certain group of people in society because it's like this is an elite thing, right? Absolutely. Um, it's not open to your like your average Joe. <laughs> you can't just walk down the street and be visited by a a luminary a disguised in a human body and is taught all this incredible, um, you know, knowledge and mystical revelation and then has the opportunity to kind of work on their soul. Like this is really only the domain or the, the profession of uh, uh, professional philosophers for people who study uh, theology. Um, yeah, for, for kind of like the, the more elite members of society, I guess. 
Yeah, and that and that's not an uncommon idea at the time, right? Aristotle yeah. basically says we need slaves so we can have philosophers. You, yeah. you know, like Ar Aristotle is is still read, respected, uh, and is an important thinker in Western thought, right? Uh, but at the same time, I I don't think a lot of people would 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 get behind that idea. So it is it is a common idea at the time. But it, look, folks, these these the, the if you are a religious Gnostic now. Again, you have to wrestle with these texts. You don't have to just read them and be like, well, it's a, it's an elite. I'm special. Nobody else is special. I'm the only one getting into Gnostic heaven. You know, I, I do just want to kind of bring, we're talking about uh, very scholarly understandings of these texts, right? But there are people yeah. who want to practice with them religiously. Now, that said, Gnosticism is, we live in a, you know, in a, in a uh, well, I shouldn't say we, because people are listening to this all around the world, but uh, you and I are mostly working in a, in, in a Western context, even though I, I don't know why Australia is part of the west it's not particularly <laughs> western but uh, uh we live in very secular societies uh and uh, uh religion in many ways uh in its organized forms is dying so gnosticism is not going to be a, a mass religion as much as we want it to be right there aren't going to be millions of gnostics by by default it's going to be a small amount of people so in the modern age it is a self-selecting elite so listener if you want to be part of the gnostic elite you are. Congratulations. <laughs> but at the time, you could also understand, too, you know, not very many people could read. Uh, as you've gathered, we keep talking about how, how dense these texts are and how they reference all these things. They want you to catch the references, right? You have to be very well educated even now, yeah. let alone then. Uh, yes. And again, you know, if you're working from the toil of uh, 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 day in, day out, you, you don't have time to read these scrolls, understand these concepts, and do these spiritual practices. So, yeah. you know, uh, there's uh, I'm doing. I, I love doing my little songs and dances. So I, I hope I hope people like my my uh, my little tap dance there. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, um, like historically speaking, people who I guess in an ancient context who were able to read were usually uh, scribes or people of a priestly kind of caste in society, right? So. Um, this this person is prob probably already has spiritual inclinations of some kind or is able to kind of set time aside to study philosophy um, or to not only to study philosophy because philosophy wasn't, you know, a book that you open. Um, <laughs> a philosophy, according to Plato, was a lifestyle. It was your way of life. And remember the goal of the philosopher was to uh, use the rational soul so yeah. everything you did in life had to be geared towards that purpose. It wasn't kind of, you know, Monday to Friday you could have lust and debauchery and on the weekend <laughs> you could, you know, uh, quickly try and recover your rational soul and you'd be fine or even the other way around, right? So it was something that was an ongoing process. It wasn't, you know, um, like the, the quick fixes that we have in modern society where we just want to open a book, we just want to read it, we want to be enlightened straight away. Like that's that absolutely not how philosophy worked in the ancient world. No, no, it, um, it was cohesive. It was systematic. Yeah. It, it, uh, it, it was very much what we would think of as as religion now, to be honest, right? As in, it, yeah. you know, it touches all aspects of your life. Uh, you're not just getting up, reading a book, and thinking for for an hour, and then, you know, as you said, you know, going to the brothel. Uh, you know, <laughs> it is it, it it impacted every aspect of what you did, and you you were expected yes. to devote yourself to it. You know, twenty four seven. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I think it's also important that we haven't really touched on, or I guess in sometimes some some spots we have. I can't remember; it's been so long now. But um, uh, that there is absolutely an oral teaching component to these to these stories as well. So, like I said before, uh, we're in a in a time where it's almost two thousand years later from from when this kind of culture and people were happening. And, of course, there's written literature, but as we've just said, that's only really accessible to a certain component of society. But, of course, there has to be a practical component as well. Like if this is a philosophical religious system, there has to be some kind of component of worship or perhaps, you know, community getting together to perform ritual. Um, we absolutely know that there was at least baptismal rituals that were part of these um, early Christian or Gnostic communities. Um, as to the specifics of what occurred in those rituals, it's incredibly ambiguous because we don't have any texts that explicitly uh, spell that out. We only kind of, again, have hints in different texts. For example, like the uh, baptismal ritual of the five seals, which is something that's incredibly ambiguous and scholars are still trying to work out perhaps what that might be. Um, 
but yeah, there's absolutely a community component. There's a an oral teaching component. There's perhaps a practical component. So yes, we we are only kind of privy to a very very specific kind of uh, understanding or iteration of kind of what was most likely a a much bigger thing or a kind of much more well rounded thing, right? So exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I think that's pretty much all that I was I was going to chat about. Unless you have anything else you want to talk no, about, uh, this was awesome. And you know, th- we actually have gone on long enough uh, uh, for this to be a, a separate episode, I believe. And you know, again, yeah. uh, and viewers, to to let you know the the genesis of Genesis behind Genesis, uh, we are <laughs> we have been recording this all in one go. It, it, I believe we will have enough for three episodes. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, viewers, listeners will know that I I, I have um, incarnated a divine spark into a uh, into a uh, an earthly flesh prison. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we uh, uh, we are uh, taping a lot of shows in advance. Um, but uh, we we are going to do more parts. I mean, if we're going to talk about the Neo Neo plane, and it's chances are we're going to get another three hours out of that. What do you think, Joanne? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, easy, easy. And I, I'm really, I'm really uh, uh, looking forward to digging into that uh, because there's, I, I think, some really interesting connections, um, controversial connections. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to again piss some people off uh, by talking <laughs> about uh, uh, what exactly is going on between the the neoplatonists and uh the gnostics now yeah. I, I guess i do have a question you know that is 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 gnosticism a form of middle platonism is gnosticism a parody of platonism because we we are taking some ideas from from plato from the later platonists from all these thinkers that you talked about but you know we, we, they're twisting them a little bit right like you know as we keep talking about like their demiurge is definitely not the demiurge of the timaeus he is not the demiurge of of the of of the middle platonist so what what's what do you have an opinion on this um i do but my opinion kind of defers to that of of john turner so uh, i take him as the supreme authority on this and i think that's kind of uh stepping away kind of uh, from a modern view where like we were saying before something has to influence something you know Mm -hmm. there's this reciprocal relationship so i think for the most part john turner argues um that uh, Gnosticism is an iteration of Platonism. Um, just, I think it's kind of, you know, we're, we're privileging what our definition of Platonism is in, in the modern period, which is why we've kind of, you know, divided it into different eras, you know, Academy, Old Academy, um, Middle Platonism, Neoplatonism, and so on. We kind of are very rigid in our concept of what Platonism is and, you know, who was allowed to do Platonism. I run into these same arguments for my thesis when I was writing about Apuleius because uh, Apuleius wasn't in scholarship considered a legitimate Middle Platonic philosopher for a long time because uh, he wrote the Metamorphosis, which is a you know a satirical comedy, and you know how dare he write a comedy that can't be Platonism, <laughs> and there was this whole other thing, right? So I think to step back and kind of think about uh, what our definition of Platonism is and how we can see it change through time. Um, but yeah, certainly, I certainly do think that um, Gnosticism is a kind of flavor of Platonism. It's happening in the same period, happening in the same time. There are the same thinkers that are kind of contributing to this kind of uh, interchangeable tradition. So, and yeah, absolutely. Once we talk about Neoplatonism, we're going to see how there's those direct uh, connections and how kind of uh, Plotinus in particular responds to that kind of Gnostic understanding or manifestation of Platonism and kind of, you know, argues against it and then makes uh, makes his own arguments in favour of, of what he sees Platonism to be. So, yeah, I think it's definitely, it's part of the tradition. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, there's still this stigma around Gnosticism, as I think we were mentioning before, that you know, a lot of people just don't seem to take it seriously or think it's just, you know, some kind of anomaly or some kind of blip that happened at some point in the past. But, yeah, I think that's um, that's what modern scholarship is trying to do, is trying to bring back the legitimacy. And you can see that, like, from the 90s onwards, there's this explosion in Gnostic scholarship. It's They're only talking about Gnosticism and Platonism and the connections, right? That's basically all John Turner talks about, essentially, is that deep um, platonic connection with Gnosticism. And, of course, there are many others, many other scholars. But, um, yeah, so I definitely am on, and I'm 
and I'm on Team Gnostic. Slash yes. Play yeah. Yeah, and uh, you'll be shocked to discover that that I agree with you. That, that <laughs> might be that might be what they call it in in the podcasting biz a leading question. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. and it, it's been amazing. I can't wait to have you back. And actually, you know, you should come on sometime and talk about the Metamorphosis slash the Golden Ass because oh, I love that yes. book so much. I, I think. Oh, you know, I love it too. Yeah, and of course, you know, we have a very expansive view of the Gnosis on this show, right? We talk yes. about lots of sort of things kind of connected to it, but of course, there is a lot of Gnosis in that book and it's funny it's funny for a modern audience it's it's, it's incredible it's a, it's a I, yeah. yeah yeah we're asking a lot of listeners but mm. i please stop the podcast and go and read the metamorphosis or the, the golden ass by apuleius yeah. or the golden yeah. ass sorry because it's incredible and you'll love it and you'll be completely perplexed by the end of the story and how it changes suddenly, but it's amazing. So please go and read it. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll thank us. It is an actual yeah. novel. You, you can't pause, novel. but, yeah. but now you can read it. You're going to have lots of time before we do that show. So yes. b- before we go, I, I will do the commercial again. It's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Uh, you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media a month. Uh, we do about six pieces of media a month. You can put a cap on that. If you're scared that we're going to do millions and millions and uh, you can do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. You could also help us out by just telling people about the show, uh, sharing it, uh, liking, subscribing, leaving good comments. Because, you know, I, I always, I'm always on, on here begging for money with my digital cap out. But, like, I don't have any money. Chances are most of you don't have any money. But you can help us out in other ways. Uh, because, you know, money is the worst archon of them all, isn't it, Joanne? Um <laughs> Uh, a pleasure and honor. Uh, we're going to do about, uh, the, uh, well, talking about a, a million pieces of, of content per month. Uh, we, we've got a lot more <laughs> with, with Joanne when when she has free time. And, of course, <laughs> in a couple of years' time, when she when she makes a book out of all this stuff, when she does her master's thesis, her PhD dissertation, and then gets it published by a big publisher, everybody go out and uh, get a copy. Get a copy for your friend, because uh, <laughs> uh, for your family, because it, it's going to be the uh, the, the greatest uh the bottom book on Gnostics has ever written uh okay it's <laughs> been uh yeah okay. thanks everyone bye bye, bye.